good evening. It's not evening, it's afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Uneducated economists here. All right, oops. All right, so just uh, quick, how many people have uh, know who I am? How many people have seen my YouTube channel? Oh, wow, all right, cool. So there is quite a few of you. How many are subscribed? All right, a little less, all right, that's okay. I just passed 128,000 subscribers, it's huge. This is something I never thought I would have in my life, you know? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so let me just kind of get started, a little introduction to myself. My name is Simon, I host the YouTube channel Uneducated Economist, and I started my channel in November of 2017. Now, it was kind of interesting, I have been talking a lot about in macroeconomics to a lot of my friends and coworkers, and uh, you know, like a lot of us out here, just trying to figure things out and just explaining some of the things that I was finding. And I remember one day at work, um, one of the coworkers there, a lady named Brittany, and uh, Brittany was a really tall farm girl, long blonde hair, rides horses and stuff, she's kind of tough. And she comes up and she puts her fist on my desk and she says, listen dude, you're gonna have to start a YouTube channel or a blog or something because nobody here understands what you are talking about and you are driving us crazy, right? <laughs> And I went, oh, right, okay. Right, I hear you. So I grabbed my camera, which was a used iPhone 6. I went down to my car, which was this old Aurora, like I paid $600 for it or something. And I fired up my camera and I did an introductory video to the uneducated economist. I went back into the work, used the works Wi-Fi to upload that video and the uneducated economist was born, All right? Thank you. And, um, I had no idea what I was gonna do with this channel. Like, I put that first video out and I knew I wanted to talk about like economics, I wanted to talk about cryptocurrencies. So I put out a few of those videos and nobody really ever paid attention to any of them. Like, you know, I think my mom and my wife, you know, they were like the only like subscribers and viewers to my channel. And um, I work in the building industry, right? So I, I sell lumber supply or building supplies and lumber and uh, I did a video talking about lumber correlated it to the housing market and oh my gosh that video just took off like all of a sudden I had like a thousand views on a video and I went oh no this is way too much right I got to delete my channel yeah and uh, this is too much attention and people were like no man this is good stuff keep going right keep keep talking about these things that uh, you're experiencing with your boots on the ground information coming from the lumber industry we're loving it right and I'm like Okay, you know, so let's let's do let's do lumber videos. Let's do videos talking about macroeconomics. Let's just kind of use this YouTube channel as my own personal journal and just kind of see what happens from it. So I committed myself to making daily videos. Now I didn't get a video out every day, but I did a pretty good job of putting out a video just about every day or every other day. And when you start doing that every day, man, does it change your life right? There's things that really start to happen. And uh, man, did my life really change. So really when it came down to the lumber industry and I was putting out lumber videos, I had been putting out like all throughout 2019 videos talking about mill curtailments and mill shutdowns and inventory depletions, right? And again, this is all throughout 2019. So when 2020 hit and COVID came in and locked everything down and the mills went into even more curtailment, inventory depleted even more, and then we had those stimulus checks come out and it wiped inventory, right? There was nothing left out there as far as the lumber industry goes, and the prices went through the roof. It was then that my channel got the most popularity. People wanted to know what was going on. And so when you had so much idea of inflation and money printing and everything going on, it seemed like that's what was occurring within the lumber industry. But I was one of the few people out there screaming, no, this is a supply chain breakdown. I've been reporting on this all throughout 2019 going into 2020. Believe me, these prices are going to come back down. Well, here we are today. We're back at 485 per thousand, which is about the price that we were at back in 2018. So where did all the inflation go, right? There is inflation out there. You can see it. The Fed has printed up all this money, but it really comes down to a supply and demand issue when it came to the lumber industry. And that's really what I was pointing out at the time and what really got me you know, pretty famous on the internet for. 
I had contractors, real estate agents, I even had hedge funds calling me up and saying, or emailing me saying, hey man, thanks for this great information that you're putting out, it's unlike anybody else's. And again, it was from the view that I had from the position that I was at. And that's something that I think a lot of us don't realize we have within each one of us, is that the position that we hold for our own individual business, whether it's for me being in the lumber yard doing retail sales, or if you're working at the mill, or if you're doing log truck, you know, driving log trucks, or whatever is going on, every single one of us has a view that is quite unique to us, right? And now what I found is that most people who are looking for this information are looking for the information that we are living every day, right? And if you can see it, you can be ahead of anybody else out there. But you really have to understand the macroeconomics of things. And that's really what I think my channel has done a great job of doing, is to try and explain this thing in a way that you can look at it as an individual yourself. Because, you know, nobody's going to really know what you need to do. All right. Like if you were 18 years old looking to figure out what it is that you need to do to invest and you know, have something for retirement is going to be a whole lot different than if you're 80 years old trying to figure out how it is that you're going to hold on to your retirement. These two people are not going to be doing these same things, but yet we're all looking at the same information. So this is really where I think like looking at the macroeconomics information from a personal point of view is really how you know, studying economics should be done. And when you do that, then you can start making decisions for yourself that's not really based on somebody else's opinion, but just your more of your own understanding of macroeconomics itself. So um, let me see, what did I want to talk about? Um, so let's see here. When it comes to like the lumber industry itself, right? That was one of the reasons why I was able to call it out so well is because of the position that I was in. Right? So when I think about this, how did I understand what was going on within the lumber industry when like the people sitting right next to me didn't see it? They're calling out manipulation and greed and all kinds of stuff. And I'm like, guys, I'm, I'm right here, I'm making the videos. Like, how can you be saying this stuff, right? I mean, I got the information that is not, you know, that's not what you are saying. But yet everybody was kind of stuck on this. Well, again, I think it was because of the understanding in macroeconomics that I do. So I based it down to uh, four theories, right? And if you're new to macroeconomics, if you're just new to trying to understand this stuff, by taking on these four particular theories, just understanding what they are, it really starts to answer a lot of the economic questions that we have out there about the you know, situations that we're in. And when you start looking at it from these four different economic theories, it really clears the, a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the pictures up, starts filling in those blanks. So I'm gonna talk about these four economic theories and how they, uh, and then give some examples of how we can find them here in the, in the economy today. So the first one is Cantillon's uh, effect, right? Now a lot of people will say this Cantillon, right? But he was a French economist from way back in the day, like the 1700s. He wrote one of the first essays on economics. It was called Cantillon's Essay on Economic Theory. Now in this essay, there are three chapters. Uh, increase and decrease of money to a state and the further reflections upon that topic. Those three chapters are absolutely incredible to understanding how money flows into the system and how it separates the rich from the poor, how it drives in domestic or drives out domestic manufacturing, bringing in uh, foreign production and eventually driving everybody into poverty. Now, the Cantillon effect is really pretty simply explained that when new money comes in, the new money starts driving up the prices and the people at the end of the line have last access to the new money. They suffer the most as their wages haven't gone up, but yet the prices of everything has. Now that's Cantillon effect shortly, right? Just kind of simply explained. But he talks about it much de deeply, right? He gets into some really, uh, he really explains it very, very accurately and to how these powers of this economic force will begin to take place once you have that new money coming into the system. So the way Cantillon describes it is with a silver mine. So if we can imagine a new silver mine comes into a particular area, you know, region or whatever, the people who have first access to that, to that silver mine, they're the ones who get to enjoy the new money, right? Whatever their wants, their desires, their pleasures, whatever it is that they want, that's where they spend their money. And the people who have those wants and, or the, the products that those people want, the services, the whatever, they also have first access to the money. 
So what ends up happening is when this new money comes into the system and the people have access to this money, they start enjoying the new money that comes into the system, you know, that they, that they have, right? You don't want to get this new money and just say, hey, that's cool, I'm just going to set it over there and not do anything with it. You want to enjoy it, right? So they start buying better houses, eating more food, wearing nicer clothes, right? And this, in turn, starts moving back into the production of the, of the rest of the people out there within the economy as they start to enjoy that new money, right? So this starts to deprive or it starts to cause the supply-demand imbalances to occur. Now, this is very interesting to think about because as the supply-demand imbalance begins to occur, you have the prices start to elevate. Again, this is how the people at the end of the line suffer the most and the wedge is driven between the rich and the poor. But this is where the interesting thing starts to take place, is that if this new money continues to come in and the prices continue to go up, what you will find is form production start to move in. Because right? it's going to compete with the domestic manufacturing. As these prices move up, foreign production that's cheaply, cheap made, cheaply made in another land, traveling to that particular region now is cheaper than domestic manufacturing. What ends up coming on is more foreign production and driving out ever-increasing amounts of domestic manufacturing until eventually, if this new money continues to pour in this fashion, that the only people left are those who are have first access to the money, the people that they spend that money on, the foreign production that comes in, everybody else at the end of the line suffers in poverty as the domestic manufacturing has finally left. And if the new money uh, turns off, everybody falls into poverty as the foreign production will cease to come in and the domestic manufacturing just simply isn't there to provide anything anymore. All right, isn't that fun? Okay, so that, that, that's, Cantillon, that's Cantillon effect in a nutshell, but it's the new money that's coming into the system that we have to think about. When that new money comes in, people dive into luxuries, that dive into luxury starts bringing in the foreign production, which drives out the domestic manufacturing, eventually depriving the people at the end of the line of a, of a decent standard of living, and if the new money turns off, everybody falls into poverty. All right, so Cantillon effect. The next uh, economic theory is is one called Gresham's Law. And now Gresham's Law is really interesting. Um, it was a Thomas, Je uh, Thomas Jess, Gresham, yes. Uh, from back in the 1500s noticed that if you have two forms of currency in the system, you're gonna have one that is gonna be more accepted than the other, right? So you have good currency and bad currency. Now, if they're both accepted, for the most part, the people who are, who are in possession of the money, who have a choice on whether or not they can use this one or that one, are generally gonna hold on to the good one and give up the bad one. So bad money chases out the good. Okay, which is really weird to think about. Like, you know, bad money chasing out good. You think bad money's bad, nobody would want to use it. Good money's good and everybody would want to use it. But that's not really what happens. I mean, think about it from your own personal, you know, like if you had paper dollars in one hand and a gold coin in the other and you go to make a purchase with somebody and the guy says, yeah, I'll take either one of those, I don't care. You'd be like, well, I'm gonna hold on to the gold coin, here you go, right? That's exactly how Gresham's Law works and that's how the bad money ends up chasing out all the good as the good money will get hoarded away. Now, Gresham had noticed this with coin clipping and debasement of metal. So if you can imagine you got a coin, you know, a silver coin, and somebody's clipped off a little bit of the edges of it to try and keep that metal for themselves, well, then you would have a coin that is less valuable than one that's completely whole. Well, the clipped coin would make it into circulation. You would hold on to the whole coin, and that's, again, the bad money chasing out the good. Or if it was debased with copper or something else, then you have one that's a solid silver coin. You got one that's a copper clad or a copper mix or something. Again, the copper goes into circulation and the silver gets hoarded away. So this is Gresham's law. And when you think about it, there's what happens when Gresham's law flips and bad money gets chased out by the good. There's an uh, that is uh, Thier's law. All right, so Thier's law is exactly the opposite of Gresham's, and it's not a competition to Gresham's law or a counter to Gresham's law. It's a complementary to it, because what it's saying is, is that once the current system of money has completely failed and it's no longer accepted, only good currency can then come into the system. So bad money chased, uh, chasing out good money is Gresham's law, and then good money chasing out bad is Thier's law. But again, when the good money comes to chase out the bad, it's because the bad money has gone completely worthless. All right. Next uh, economic theory is Triffin's Dilemma, or also known as Triffin's Paradox. Now, this is a pretty interesting uh, observation that, uh, uh, what was it, Robert Triffin? Yeah, uh, Robert Triffin had pointed out 
in that if you are going to be the issuer of the world reserve currency, you have to run trade deficits at the same time. And now this is pretty interesting to think about. Like how is it that, you know, if you're gonna be this world reserve currency issuer that you have to run trade deficits? Well, you have to think like, how is it that this money gets out to the world? Right? Now you can do currency swaps and all kinds of stuff, but ultimately when a nation wants US dollars, what they're gonna do is sell something to the United States and the United States will purchase that with dollars. And this is how dollars really make it out to the rest of the world as we are an importer of stuff, not necessarily an exporter. We import stuff and export dollars. Right? So this is where Triffin had really noticed that if you are going to be that issuer of world currency, how do, you run, how do you not run trade deficits? You can't, you have to run trade deficits in order to get the dollars out there. At least that's what he was pointing out at the time. So we have Cantillon's effect, right? Where new money, or yeah, when new money comes into the state, people dive into luxuries, it drives in ever increasing amounts of foreign production, drives out ever increasing amounts of domestic manufacturing until the new money turns off and everybody falls into poverty. You got Gresham's law where bad money chases out good, Thiers law where good money chases out bad, and then you got Triffin's dilemma where you have the issuer of the world currency and the only way you can do that is by running trade deficits. Now that leads me into the very last, well, into the fourth economic theory that I like to follow, which is the bullwhip effect. Now the bullwhip effect, this is, uh, this is kind of an economic phenomenon that takes place within the distribution network where misunderstandings from the retail side of things through the distribution network, the wholesalers, we, you know, distributors, all the way up to the manufacturers, nobody has a clear view of what has taken place within this, within this supply chain and you end up with situations where you have oversupply and undersupply taking place and this is the bullwhip effect you know, in short. So I think the easiest way to describe the bullwhip effect is to tell a story about a plumbing fitting. And now, a lot of you know that I work at a hardware store, I do retail sales for a living. Plumbing fittings, you know, is part of our, is part of our inventory that we sell. Now, there's this particular plumbing fitting. It's a four inch rubber coupling with hose clamps on each end of it. A lot of you might know it by a brand name, but it's a very simple piece and they're not very expensive. They're only like 10 bucks, right? Now, when these things came up in short supply, right, and everything came up in short supply, but this particular fitting comes up in short supply and it's a critical part for a lot of like drainage systems or if you're hooking up septic systems or doing repairs, you form, you know, you want to connect a plastic pipe to cast iron. These rubber couplings are like so easy to use. They join two uncommon pieces of pipe, no problem. So when they come up in short supply, the people who do excavation work or groundwork or drainage or something like that, they come in for these fittings and they couldn't find them. And they're like, well, when do you get them? Like, I don't know, man. I mean, everything's in short supply, they'll eventually get here, right? So these guys, they have a job that they need to complete and it's being held up by a $10 part. Now you can incorporate this into all kinds of parts of the economy. I mean, think about chip shortages in cars or something like that, right? Same thing. So now this part, it's come up missing, but if finally we get some inventory, right? Customer comes in and says, oh good, you finally got it. <laughs> Takes it all, right? And I'm like, whoa, man, you don't have to take it all, you know, there's plenty on the shelf, you only need the one, right? And he was like, oh, no, see, they were in short supply, I missed out on $10,000, or I had $10,000 held up on a $10 part, I ain't doing that again, no way, they're all mine, right? Okay, so it's panic buying. Well, the next customer who comes in realizes that we're out on the shelf because this last customer has just taken it all, same thing happens again, as soon as we get some inventory and boom, it's gone, right? They buy it all up and again, this is panic buying that has taken place. This isn't real consumer demand. This is false demand that's happening, right? Well now, the algorithms don't see this, right? Like most people's inventory is set up on a computer algorithm. So when the inventory drops, the computer says, hey, order some more. But if the computer recognizes, the algorithm recognizes that you are constantly out of stock, well then it's gonna want you to increase your inventory level, right? If you're only carrying four, well you mean to carry six or eight, right? So all of a sudden, the algorithm says, hey, we need to beef up our order from four to eight. Well, I can imagine that not only am I doing it, but if other retailers are doing that, what kind of signal is that sending through the distribution network, right? So now all of a sudden the wholesaler is looking at these doubled orders that are coming up. There's this huge overwhelming consumer demand and they go all the way up to the, you know, through the distribution network saying, man, we got orders, 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 orders until it gets to the manufacturers. Manufacturers are like, yeah, no problem, let's ramp up production. They start ramping up production, get this production out there into the distribution network. All of a sudden, all this product comes to the retailers. Retailers fill up their shelves. 
and nobody's buying. Yeah. <laughs> That's right, and this is the blow-up effect, and now all of a sudden you find people over there in the manufacturing side going, whoa, where are the orders, yo? And it's like there are no orders. Then you start having inventory, or you start having shutdowns and curtailments and everything else that comes from the manufacturing side of things. So this is the bullwhip effect, right? So again, we got Cantillon's effect, we got Gresham's Law, Triffin's Dilemma, and the bullwhip effect. Now, if you incorporate these four economic theories, you can generally find that almost every economic situation that you are looking at usually has either one or a combination of these four theories going on. You know, you think about it from the United States, right? Back in the 50s, 60s, the United States was a manufacturing powerhouse, right? And I mean, you can take this story back as far as you want, but really, you know, 50s and 60s, that's what we were known for, right? We had one income, be able to provide enough for a whole household, you know, vacations, college tuitions, cars, everything, right? This is all off of one income. When you think about it, we were exporting to the world. They were sending us gold, right? We were loading up on gold. Is it amazing why, I mean, is it any question why our standard of living was, in, was rising here? I mean, right, we got all the gold. So now we think about this for just a second. It was just like, okay, well, if the new money is coming in in gold and it's due to our manufacturing output, when we started becoming more of an importer and our domestic manufacturing started to leave, what was gonna leave with it? The gold, right? So we were like, uh-oh, man, can't be having that, right? Can't be having the gold leaving. So we ended up severing that gold standard and went completely onto the fiat currency. Otherwise, all the gold was gonna leave and we were gonna end up in poverty, just like Cantillon was describing. So I think about that for just a little bit. And it was just like, well, how did the dollar end up being in that position? Like, I mean, really, it was just like, we can say, oh, well, it was manipulation of men and all this other stuff. Sure, right? I mean, there's plenty of evidence of that out there. But really, when we think about Gresham's law, right, what was really happening here? We had gold and we had the dollar. And if you held a certain amount of dollars, you could get a fixed amount of gold. Well, people kind of looked at that as one and the same. Right? And it was just like, yeah, you know, dollars are as good as gold. Now, we understand it differently nowadays, but back then they didn't, right? They were just like, no, it's just, you know, the same thing. If I have my, you know, certain amount of dollars, I'll be able to get a fixed amount of gold. And everybody believed this, including the world. And the world was like, hey, we need something to do transactions with. We need liquidity. And you guys have all the gold. Like, how do we do transactions amongst each other? I was just like, well, the United States can freely spend these dollars with you and you can use these dollars to do your transactions with. Well then, so the demand for liquidity, is that what really did it? So all of a sudden you have the world looking, yes, finally we can do transactions free that we have all this liquidity that we can do. Isn't this awesome? Until they realized, oh, you mean all these, dollar, all these dollars we have, I can't exchange them for the gold? There's not enough gold for all these dollars? Yeah, that's right. Gresham's Law, right? Good money and bad money. Think about this. These two were sharing a symbiotic relationship with each other. They were just the same thing, but then one day they realized they weren't. Gold goes away and dollars are left in the system. Bad money chasing out good. You see how that works, right? So Gresham's Law was pretty apparent right there. So you got Cantillon's effect and Gresham's Law showing right there how the, how the dollar ended up getting its position with the world currency or being the world reserve currency. So now, Triffin's dilemma, we think about this. How is it that the United States is going to continue to be the issuer of world currency unless we continue to run trade deficits? The moment that we stop running trade deficits, then we stop exporting the, the dollars out to the rest of the world. Well, the demand for dollars around the world is going to be quite extreme. A lot of people don't realize how much debt is due in dollars that is outside of the United States. Okay? Sovereign nations, corporations, entities all over the world have written debts in dollars, due in dollars. That means when those things come due, if they do not roll them over into new debts, they need to acquire the dollars in order to pay those debts off. Something very interesting starts to happen to the dollar when there's such a demand to pay off those debts. You start running into liquidity issues, right? So now you have the Federal Reserve right now sitting in a position in which that they are tightening up the currency, right? A lot of people 
don't realize that, but the Federal Reserve is in a quantitative tightening where they are bringing in their liabilities, right? Their liabilities being the dollars that they put out there. Well, this pull on the liabilities is gonna start creating liquidity issues with people outside of the United States in order to pay off their debts. That's gonna cause the dollar to strengthen even more, at least in my opinion it will be. So now I think about this. When you have the BRICS nations out there who are saying, nah, we don't want this dollar. We're not interested in it anymore. We're not gonna do any deals with it. Okay, well, that's fine, but it's not really a world reserve currency that you're gonna use in order to do your deals if you're one of these BRICS nations. Russia's a great example of this. Russia and India have been doing deals in oil using rupees. Russia ended up with a lot of rupees. They don't know what to do with them. Right? So now what are they going to do? They sold all this oil cheaply to India, sitting on rupees, and have no place to go with it. This is the reason why Triffin's Dilemma, right? How are you going to export your stuff to the world, right, and still provide them with a the world reserve currency? You're not going to be able to do it, right? So now here India is telling Russia, well, yeah, we did sell, you know, buy a bunch of oil off you with these rupees, and you don't have any place to go with them. How about we figure out an investment for you, right? So you can invest it back with our nation. So now I think about that. It was just like, well, what if I'm Russia and I'm thinking, I don't want anything from you. Like, I want something from this other nation over here, but you can't do anything with it because you're stuck in rupees, right? This is going to make it very difficult for the BRICS nations to introduce a world reserve currency that competes against the dollar because the moment that they do, they are trying to introduce a bad currency into the system. It won't work like that, right? You're gonna have to introduce a good currency into the system once the current system has failed. So even the idea of BRICS bringing in a gold-backed currency, still Gresham's Law says it isn't gonna happen because the moment that somebody says, here, I have a gold-backed currency, say, thank you very much, right? And pull that away and keep it for yourself. And here, you can have this bad currency that is out there. So introducing a good currency like the BRICS nation's gold idea is going to become very difficult when we understand it from Thier's Law or from Gresham's Law. Now, there is examples of like nations out there who have like Venezuela, who completely moved out of the dollar saying you can't use dollars in our nation whatsoever. And you can see in those nations, they don't do well. Like those nations are not successful. They're not like exactly up and coming and doing, you know, like awesome things. But now Venezuela did something a couple of years ago and they said, okay, hey, we got a lot of economic pain here going on. Let's go ahead and just start using some of these dollars within the, within the nation. And sure enough, boom, man, economic activity started happening like everywhere. Because you think about it, if you have all these dollars and you can go into Venezuela and now spend these dollars like they're, you know, like you got awesome currency going on here and you're buying things up. Well, the rest of the economy starts to enjoy that new money coming in. So all of a sudden there's commerce happening and everybody's doing really well and there's all this economic activity. But that new money was limited. So as it made its way through the economy and everybody was happy with it, the most industrious people out there started hoarding the dollars, right? And then pretty soon there was no more dollars left into the system. And then the economic pain started to kick back in because Gresham's Law is saying, good money will be chased out by the bad. So if you have a good currency in there and there's two forms of it, good and bad, the good money gets pulled out and that's exactly what we saw in Venezuela. Um, let me see, there was another example I wanted to share with you guys. Um, sorry, I'm pulling out, did I write it down? <laughs> I guess I forgot that one. Um, so those are the four economic theories, uh, and you can use those pretty much in all kinds of, of you know, economic you know, events that are happening out there. You might even find it in your own personal life. Like, you know, you think about the new money coming in if you get a new job, right? You have this new money coming in, you're enjoying buying a car, you know, and pretty soon you get laid off, and then what happens, right? You start going into bankruptcy. It's the same thing that happens on an individual basis all the way up to big, you know, big sovereignties and stuff like that going on. Um, so when I take on these theories, when I think about it, really it it's becomes more of a subconscious thought now. I don't think about like, you know, is this Gresham's Law kicking in here? I just immediately know, it's just like I think about it, it's just like, well, if they're going to try and do that, these things are going to have to happen, right, according to these particular theories. So you can use these things every day in your own life, right? So just, you know, study up a little bit on these four theories and you're going to find that, man, this answers so many questions that you have out there when it comes to the economics. 
Um, there's a fifth theory out there that I really like to follow as well. And I put this one kind of separate because it really doesn't go along with these other ones. It's kind of like my own theory, and it's called the credible threat theory. Now, I got this credible threat theory from a Ben Bernanke speech back in 2001. And he was talking about deflation and how to prevent it from ever occurring here in the United States, which is something that's pretty interesting to think about on its own, that they were more concerned about deflation than they were about inflation. And again, this was back in 2001 that he gave this, uh, gave this speech. And he said that the reason why they're more concerned about deflation is because they're running into what they refer to as the lower bound. This is when the Fed funds rate hits zero. Right? Once it hits zero, their monetary policy has really become ineffective. Typically, during a downturn, the Federal Reserve would want to drop the Fed funds rate around 5% in order to stimulate the economy. But if you're sitting at 2% on the Fed funds and you try and drop it down to zero, that's not going to have a meaningful impact into the economy. You think about it, if you could drop the Fed funds rate around 5%, this is going to spark people out there to go and buy houses and cars and go on vacation and do all the things with this new money you know, from, from the debt issuance that is coming out. But if you can't drop that interest rate enough, it's not going to really inspire the people to go out there. Ben Bernanke knew this. He knew it was going to be a problem. But he said, but that's OK, because we have other ways of dealing with our monetary policy. And part of that is what I refer to, again, as the credible threat theory. Now, he tells a story to describe this credible threat, and I think it just it, it does such a good job of describing it. But really, if you could imagine a guy invents a gold machine. And with this gold machine, he can produce as much gold at will with very little cost or energy going into this machine. The moment that information gets out to the markets, the price of gold would plummet. Even before the guy produces a single ounce of gold, even before he has the machine to do it, the credible threat alone would be enough to change the markets. And that right there is what the Federal Reserve uses on a regular basis is credible threat theories. Now, they will call it like job owning or forward guidance or the new term signaling. Like that's my favorite one, signaling, right? But it's all credible threats. They are trying to condition the market to behave in a certain fashion so that there won't be a shock and awe event by their actions. So when they raised interest rates three quarters of a point, if they had made that secret and then all of a sudden dropped that onto the market, it would have flipped everybody out, right? But instead, what they did for months ahead of time is they gave warning, it's going to be a half a percent, it's going to be 2%, it's going to be one, you know, like all this stuff that everybody just knew it was going to be elevated, right? It was going to be a significant, significant increase. So when they did go and raise the interest rates, had almost no impact like almost no impact on the market whatsoever. Things already started to rise. The mortgage rates started to rise, you know, yields started to go up. Everybody was getting prepared ahead of time before the Fed moved, right? So as soon as the Fed moved, boom, markets already absorbed, all the pain was already in position, and this is how they guide the markets ahead of time to make sure that there is no shock and awe event. But it's really more than just trying to guide the markets so that there isn't the shock and awe event. They really use these credible threats into an extreme fashion. Now, a lot of us remember the corporate debt lending facility. Remember this during the, during the COVID you know, stimulus packages? They set up a corporate debt lending facility. This is an entity, a special purpose vehicle that is separated from the Fed and the Treasury. It's like its own little thing out there. They funded it with like $600 billion or something. It was like insane. And then they put out this information that they were going to be buying corporate debt. People flipped out. I mean, I was one of them. Like, I'm like, man, look at what they're doing here. The Federal Reserve is going to be buying up all this corporate debt. They got this lending facility funded with $600 billion. It's going to be insane. They're going to pick the winners and losers. Of course, they came out and said, oh, no, we're only going to protect the fallen angels. So they bought a little bit of corporate debt. They bought some ETFs, right? Some exchange traded funds that had a combination of some corporate debt in it. And they, I forget, it was like $50 billion worth or something. It was a significant amount. And people, again, were flipping out about this. News everywhere talking about you know, the corporate debt lending facility and how the Fed was going to be buying into it. Well, something really interesting started to happen is that they dropped interest rates on the you know, US Treasuries. They were you know, going into quantitative easing. And that right there, that move, it, it drove investors into the corporate debt. See, when the yields fell on the U.S. Treasury, this is a safe and liquid asset, right? So if you're looking for a fixed return, there's no better you know, return than the U.S. Treasury is guaranteed to pay, right? Of course, you know, some people might not have the confidence in that, but that's ultimately what the, what the general view of it is. And if you cannot get a decent return off of that, like you're a fixed income investor and you're looking for yield 
and you're not finding it in the safe and liquid assets of the U.S. Treasuries, well, then you're going to have to start taking on risk. And they start finding risk in those corporate debt, right? That's where the yield was at. Not to mention, you had the credible threat coming from the Federal Reserve saying, hey, we're going to be buying corporate debt. All of a sudden, the markets are like, you know, let's front run the Fed. Right? And they started buying into corporate debt in a, massive, in a massive amount, too. They drove the yields down on this corporate debt to almost, as, in some cases, almost into negative territory. And these corporations gorged on incredibly cheap debt during this time. At the end of the day, the Federal Reserve was looking out there and saying, wow, all these corporations pretty much got all the funding they needed. We didn't you need to do really anything. You know, We just had to put out that credible threat that we were going to do it, actually establish the credible threat by buying a little bit of it. And now we just sit on our hands and let the markets take care of business. It worked out pretty well for them, didn't it? Yeah. And so this is, again, like the credible threat theory that comes from the Federal Reserve, and you can find it in all kinds of situations. I believe that there is another credible threat coming here very soon inside of the U.S. Treasury market. Now, we hear a lot of talk about how the U.S. Treasuries are going to, like the yields are just going to go off the, you know, off the charts or something, right? All of a sudden, everybody's going to be dumping out of these bonds, and there's going to be no buyer for them. Well, that's a liquidity issue that's happening there. The bond market is the, by far the most liquid market that you could ever possibly be in in the, in the world, right? Now, again, I mean, I'm not trying to say, hey, have confidence in the U.S. Treasuries. I'm just saying that's just the way it is. And if you have U.S. Treasuries, you have something that is pretty much as good as cash. I mean, you should be able to liquidate that thing right now. If you go to sell it, there'll be a buyer. But if you come into a situation in which that there isn't a buyer for one of those treasuries, that's going to send some really bad news throughout the rest of the financial markets when, a, when the most safe liquid asset doesn't have a buyer for it. Oh, no. All right? So what's going to happen here is that, obvious, the Federal Reserve is going to buy it, right? go into quantitative easing. Well, go on Google right now, Treasury bond buybacks. Right? The Treasury is loading up on cash right now. They are issuing out a lot of debt and taking on a lot of cash in the Treasury general account. So if there is a liquidity issue that's coming in 2024, like a lot of people are saying is going to be, and the bond market is going to be one of the issues that comes up as far as not being a buyer of these bonds causing the yields to rise, the Treasury is going to step in and buy back those bonds. Now, this is something that I don't believe a lot of people are aware of or even in taking into consideration. I found just a handful of articles out there on Google that even talk about this. But to me, this is a very well-established, credible threat. You think about it. The Treasury is sitting on hundreds of billions of dollars. Right? You got this issue in which that there may be you know, liquidity you know, issues coming within the Treasury market. And the Treasury is sitting there going, no, there won't. We have the money, and we're going to be buying back those bonds. If the market looks at that and says, wow, you know, we could try and front run the Treasury, well, they might just step in there and try, to, and try and do exactly that, like the special purpose vehicle and the corporate debt lending facility with the Federal Reserve. And you could actually see where the market tries to front run the Treasury by buying back those bonds before they have a chance to do it. Anyway, those are my theories that I wanted to share with you guys. Uh, I hope that they help you out. And if you have any questions, I would love to answer some questions. How many minutes are we into this right now? We're 35 minutes into it. Perfect. Do you guys have any questions? I think this would be, yes, sir. What can? Wait, 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 wait. Oh, wait, Patrick. I'm bringing the mic. No, Pat, Patrick wants to come up with the mic. Give us one second. Thank you, Patrick. We got to hear what you're saying. <laughs> You obviously uh, follow the bond market pretty good. So the one month treasury this year spiked up to almost 6%. Now I looked back in history, uh, two of the spikes, re we had two recessions with two, two other spikes. So this spike is way more than the other. So mm -hmm. what do you think is, is gonna happen with that? I think the inverted yield curve, I think that's probably what we're talking about, is when the short, you know, when the short term yields are higher than the long term, which doesn't really make sense. I mean, if you think about it, like if you were to take out a loan for a house or something, you wouldn't expect to get a lesser interest rate on a 30 year loan than on a 15 year loan, right? So the same thing in the treasury market, you should be seeing the same thing. 
My, my only concern when I look at the treasury market is that that is not a view of what the market is feeling has taken place, although a lot of people might see that, right? To me, that is a view of what the market is feeling along with the, tr with the Federal Reserve doing their balance sheet unwinding. So they're allowing like treasuries to come off their balance sheet, which obscures the market. Like that's not a necessarily like a clear view of what the market is saying because the Federal Reserve is unwinding this balance sheet. So although it is a very concerning situation, I do feel that the bailout has kind of already occurred. Like if you think about the special purpose vehicle and the corporate debt lending facility, this funded these, these corporations. It gave them a chance to gorge on incredibly cheap debt. Now a lot of these corporations sat on the cash. Right? Some of them could, and some of them were like zombie corporations, they ate it up, they're gonna go bankrupt. But a lot of them are sitting on the cash, meaning that they can make it through a recession. Like the idea of it, whether they can or can't, I don't know, right? But that's kind of like the idea that I think that comes from that, that special purpose vehicle for the corporate debt lending facility and then loading up on all that cash. Now at the same time, we have to think, what's the worst part of a recession? Corporations get bailed out, right? Well, what if they're already bailed out? You see? And the market already did it. Like the Fed didn't do it, the Treasury didn't, nobody's doing it. The market did it, did it off that credible threat. Now at the same time, what's the second part or the second worst part of a recession? Everybody loses their job, right? So you lose your job and the corporations get bailed out. Well, the corporations are already bailed out, then we just have to be worried about losing our jobs. But yet we have an unemployment that is really low and seems to be staying low. So if the Federal Reserve is mandated to do two things, low and stable prices and full employment, right? They're not mandated to make sure that the market stays, you know, they're not mandated to do any of that other stuff, right? They're mandated to do two things, low and stable prices and full employment. So if you have full employment, your only concern is low and stable prices, right? Which means that they are going to keep interest rates elevated until they can get those low and stable prices. And if you're not worried about corporations going under, then you're not worried so much about, well, even if the corporations do go under, it's not like it's going to start causing unemployment to rise dramatically. We have low unemployment, so there's room to move, right? At least from the Fed's eyes in it. So again, like I look at it, is there going to be a bailout? I think the bailout has already occurred. I think now we just have to live through the pain. You know? What about the banks? What about the banks? What about the banks with the, with the bonds that they have? Uh -huh. I mean, yeah. There's something interesting. There's a consolidation of the banks, right? And it's happening fast. But go and take a look. You can put it, you know, even the Federal Reserve, like the FRED chart, the FRED, the educational site that they use. In their charts, if you put in there, like, bank acquisitions or something like that, you're going to find, like, from the 80s till now, it has been a steady you know, downward trajectory of, of bank acquisitions. So although we see it happening now and we see like, you know, bank failures and stuff, I think this is part of the economic outcome that has been set into motion from years ago, right? But we're seeing evidence of it now and it's an extreme pain and, you know, noticeable because there's so few banks now comparatively to back in the 80s. Yeah, Thank you. yeah you bet, man. Any so other, I, done? I know there's a lot of questions out there. Okay, like, uh, you guys know this, but the more we keep doing this with the questions, we're just gonna keep going further and further behind. The good news is, in a little bit, we're gonna be able to bring economic, uh, an economic ninja back, uneducated economist, Joe Brown. We're gonna have a bunch of guys up here ready to have conversations. So we're not done yet. Thanks so much, Simon. Thank you. Thank you.